So this is a slightly more philosophical talk, um, and this is about the uh, sort of fictitious divisions that we invent for ourselves and how they sort of can harm the progress of our industry. So in this talk, I want to explore one particular fictitious division, which is the tension between OO and FP, and make an argument for why and how we can and should do better. So I love functional programming, um, and after a long time in the shadows, it's kind of uh, started to peek into the mainstream, which is great. But I still believe that mainstream wide spectrum languages like Java, for example, have even more to offer us in terms of applying functional techniques to real world problems than the purely functional languages do. And as a language designer, um, w one of the reasons why I'm, I, I work in Java is there's leverage there. There's an old, um, old joke about the famous bank robber, Willie Sutton, when they asked him, how come you rob banks? And he says, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> and languages like Java are where the users are. So if we want to help people be better programmers, the place to start is to go where the programmers are. Now, some people might say that I am not qualified to give this talk because I have this conflict of interest. Java is an OO language. I'm a Java guy. And that's fine. Um, you know, developers often have strong opinions about things they don't know anything about. So I'll ask you to indulge me while I do a bit of the same. So I'll start with a topic about which I know really nothing, but I'll talk about anyway, very briefly, which is sports. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about the, um, the social dynamics of sports and sports rivalries. So for example, in the United States, one of the biggest rivalries is that between the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. And you know, rivalries are an essential part of sports. Every team needs a rival team, and the fans, they might love their team, but they love to hate the rivals even more, right? So imagine like you know, a typical New York Yankees fan and a typical Boston Red Sox fan and these, you know, two guys actually have quite a lot in common, right? So let's put this in uh, the context of some uh, object-oriented modeling. They're both uh, people, uh, they, so they both share the behavior that people share, like drinking beer, and, you know, they're both sports fans, so they both, uh, you know, like to do the wave and uh, spout statistical gibberish, and, you know, they both hate the other guy. So, you know, in a lot of ways, they're really the kind of the same person. And certainly from the outside, if you're not a sports fan, they certainly look like exactly the same person. So, you know, th th this, this concept about, you know, differences that you can only see on the outs from the outside, you know, is, is well covered in the, uh, the geek uh, canon. Um, so, for example, like, you know, you remember that Star Trek episode where the crew encounters the species of half-black, half-white humanoids, and some are black on the left and some are black on the right, and... Of course, you know, they hate each other and they're locked in a bitter civil war and there's only two of them left and they're still trying to kill each other. And, but you know, like the sports fans from the outside, these guys kind of look like the same guy. But all they could see is how they were just like complete opposites, right? And so of course, you know, this, this was about as subtle as a sledgehammer. But you know, we play this game out every day uh, in the way we work, right? So imagine what we look like to normal people when we're arguing about spaces versus tabs or text editors. <laughs> you know, from the outside, you know, to our, you know, husbands or wives, you know, w w you know, we, we, we must look ridiculous, right? Because the spaces advocate and the tabs advocate are really indistinguishable. They're just opinionated geeks. And yet they're ready to kill each other, not only over code, but over a completely non-functional aspect of coding. And meanwhile, the, you know, um, a normal observer would be thinking, you know, if these two could just get over their stupid argument and learn to work together, then maybe my car could actually talk to my phone. So this brings me to another subject about which I know nothing, which is cultural anthropology. When a, you know, a sports team wins, what do the fans say? They say, we won even though they contributed like absolutely nothing to the winning. And you know, this is because we're naturally wired to form tribes. And tribal identity has a sensible evolutionary basis. Uh, it's a natural defense against starvation or being eaten by tigers. Uh, there aren't very many tigers roaming the streets of Stockholm these days, or at least not that I've noticed, but our brains have taken a little bit of time to catch up with that. And you know, tribalism isn't all bad, right? That's how you know, we, uh, we learn from me members of our tribe, we help each other, we collaborate, those are good. But it's a short hop from let's 
you know, help the members of my tribe to let's demonize the members of the other tribe rather than saying, well, what are we going to learn from them? And I'm sad to say that as programmers, we're bad at this. I mean, we're really bad at this. I mean, we're constantly defining our identities as we're Python programmers or C-sharp programmers or functional programmers. And then we have unconstructive arguments about why the other is wrong or foolish for preferring those primitive tools. Now, as programmers, the more I program, the more I realize how much there is to learn. And we all have so much to learn about building correct, robust, maintainable, secure, easy to use, cost-effective software that we kind of should be ashamed and certainly not criticizing each other about tabs or VI or static types or, or actors or objects or anything. The user doesn't care whether the code was written in Haskell or, or Visual COBOL, right? They just want their phone to talk to their car, and that's actually kind of reasonable. So the tribal division that I'm going to talk about today is functional programming versus object-oriented programming. It could just as easily be static versus dynamic typing or managed versus native or any number of other fictitious divisions we can invent. But these days, functional programming is popular, and so, not surprisingly, it's also popular to, to hate on, on, on object-oriented programming. And so it's easy to find blogs or talks about how OO has failed to live up to its hype. Um, and, okay, well, that's totally true. It, it has failed to live up to its hype. But realistically, has there ever been a programming technology that has lived up to its hype? The, the critics uh, of objects, they, they, they have a standard playbook. They, they take an example of object-oriented programming done badly, and, you know, and then they jump from, well, it didn't work here, to it must not work at all. And you know, to be fair, they have plenty to work with. There's lots of examples of object-oriented programming done badly, but that doesn't mean there isn't something to learn from it. So while these rants might have a point, they assume a false dichotomy. Their argument rests on, if my tribe is right, the other tribe is wrong. But OO doesn't have to be wrong for FP to be right. We all have the things we can learn from both of them. And that's really the main theme of this talk today, which is rather than investing so much in thinking of ourselves as being Python programmers or C++ programmers, you know, we should care more about becoming better programmers. We all have so much to learn, we should seek to learn as much as we can from as many paradigms as we can. So to become better programmers, my advice is, Go learn classical functional programming. Go learn classical object-oriented programming, and then strive to rise above them both. OK, so what does that mean? That sounds good, right? What does it mean? Uh, languages and paradigms are tools. Uh, and no tool is ideal for all situations. Uh, so the French philosopher Emile Chartier once said, nothing is more dangerous than an idea when it's the only idea you have. If we only have one paradigm, we're going to use it in the right times and the wrong times. We'll use it when it doesn't fit, or we'll try to distort our view of the problem into one that fits, because it's the only tool we have. Whereas a programmer who is comfortable in multiple paradigms is far more likely to find a better solution for any given problem, regardless of what language that they're using. The right solution is probably not pure OO or pure FP or pure anything, because uh, it, it kind of has to be. Um, you know, these, uh, each of these paradigms makes, uh, makes strong assumptions and focuses on one part of the problem. Uh, pure functional programming, for example, has no notion of computational resources like memory or threads or file handles, and pure OO has no notion of a computation that isn't localized to some component, but of course, every real-world problem has to deal with file handles and memory and you know, um, non-localized computations. So we need, at least minimally, to learn something from each of them. So it's easy to criticize OO. Some of it's deserved, some of it isn't. Um, OO arrived on the scenes under tremendously inflated expectations. Uh, so by like you know, 1990 or so, uh, which is, I guess, before a lot of us started programming, I guess before some of us were alive, um, the hype surrounding objects really had reached uh, absurd proportions. So most of the OO code out there is kind of what I would call sorcerer's apprentice OO, which is you take sensible principles and then you apply them to the ridiculous extreme. So for example, if encapsulation is good, more encapsulation is better, right? But realistically, that's not what you want, right? You may want a heavy lock on the front door, but you really probably don't want one on the bedroom closet. But like most OO code treats you know, family members and burglars with about the same degree of distrust. 
And, you know, just in case that wasn't bad enough, we tend to draw the boundaries before we even know what the house looks like, right? And so you get the equivalent of, you know, a bank vault door on your bedroom closet and, you know, just for good measure, one in the middle of the hallway also. Now, of course, this isn't what OO is about, but, you know, for some people, it's what comes to mind. And I think to some degree, we did this to ourselves. Um, you know, the, one of the worst offenders is the original Java Beans convention. And this was designed for a particular purpose, dynamically discoverable visual components in an interactive editor, which was a perfect application for OO. But, you know, the costs and benefits of any given technique are contextual, and they don't apply everywhere. But, you know, the Learn Java in 21 Days books told us, yep, do this everywhere, getters and setters for everything. So we got the worst of both worlds, like all the ceremonial overhead and friction without the abstractive value. Nice going. So, you know, when people think they're criticizing OO, they're really criticizing a sort of cartoon exaggeration of OO. Uh, and the conventions that might be right for a graphical component framework might be silly for most domain objects, but that doesn't mean the technique is silly. And of course, it's fun to criticize things that are popular, and sometimes it's therapeutic, but if we get too invested in these criticisms, it just makes us worse programmers because it's closing us off to what we have to learn from the other tribes. So if that's not what OO is, well, what is it? We have to step back from the details of your favorite language, C++ or Java or C Sharp. And Alan Kay once said, you know, I made up the term object-oriented, and I can tell you that I did not have C++ in mind. For example, most popular OO languages today emphasize inheritance. But class-based inheritance isn't necessary to OO. It's just one way to get polymorphism. Similarly, static typing. Most of these languages are statically typed, but Smalltalk was dynamically typed. You can have dynamically typed objects. The essence of object-oriented programming is that computation proceeds by objects sending messages to each other. And those messages don't have to be statically typed or synchronous or, or even local. You send a message to an object, and it does something in response. Maybe it performs a side effect. Maybe it sends you a message back. Maybe it sends a message to somebody else. And this structure of communication implicitly gives us polymorphism, because the only thing that's defined is the messages that you pass uh, um, uh, between each other. And so each, uh, each entity in the system is able to respond you know, in any way that meets the needs for that message. And so we can get polymorphism from a lot of ways. We can get it from classes or from prototypes or from nasty stateful logic, but that's really just a matter of bookkeeping. But the commonality is that um, complex systems do need some form of dynamic dispatch, and most OO languages make this pretty easy to express and reason about. Um, similarly, with respect to state, in, in OO, state is owned by objects. So to access an object state, you send a message to that object. And that brings us to the other major contribution of classical OO, which is encapsulation. OO languages give developers a straightforward way to say, this is my state, only I can access it. And if, if you're old enough to remember what uh, procedural programming was like uh, when that was the dominant paradigm, um, one of the biggest impediments to program scale was the reasoning about program state. Because if all the code can access a variable, then in order to reason about possible var values or refactor, you have to analyze the whole program. And encapsulation lets us turn this global analysis into a local one, which in turn frees us to build larger programs without getting mired in complexity. OK, so that's OO. What's FP? If you ask people what the essence of FP is, you'll get an answer like immutability and pure functions, or maybe pure functions as first-class values, or maybe function application by substitution. And these are all sort of good mental models, but in reality, most functional program, programming languages don't actually behave this way. And with good reason. Uh, simulating state and I.O. with monads is very cool. It's cool that you can do it, but it's not how most people want to program, and it's nearly impossible to reason about things like memory utilization. So most functional languages make some practical concessions towards the messy real world with some direct support for I.O. and mutation, and they accept the strictness that that entails, and then we rely on programmer discipline not to use those when they could be avoided. Okay. So compare computation proceeding by uh, sending messages to objects, computation proceeding by applying functions to values. Um, scaling up, in each of these paradigms, what's a program? An FP, an FP program is really just a big function, and functions have a simple role. They transform inputs to outputs. In OO, there's a sort of more ambitious notion of a program. It's an executable model of some entity. 
Um, and for any given situation, one or both of these views might be useful. Um, so one of the things that you tend to see in functional languages is that ownership of data is kind of more distributed. You have a lower degree of encapsulation, uh, especially in the dynamically typed languages like the Lisp family. Uh, almost any code can inspect uh, the innards of data that's passed to them. Um, and OO makes much more of an investment in making opaque islands of data that's owned by somebody. And there are times when this encapsulation is a lifesaver uh, for managing complexity and, and uh, security, and there are times when it just gets in the way, and that's having the bank vault door in the middle of your hallway. So as professional programmers, we're going to encounter both of these situations, and we should know how to tell them apart and how to deal with each of them. So, you know, you'll often people hear say, well, no, oh, everything's an object, and in FP, everything's a function. In fact, like, every programming style has an obligatory, you know, one sentence, everything is a summary. Everything is an object, or an actor, or a function, or a peanut butter sandwich, or, or whatever it is. And these characteristics, characterizations are useful for about the first five minutes of learning a new paradigm. But overall, they tend to be pretty destructive, because not only isn't everything an object, but in reality, nothing is an object, and nothing is a function. Um, and you know, certainly not everything is a Java bean. Objects and functions you know, and actors, they're just models. They're models that are useful for helping us understand our code and our strategy for understanding the problem. But th we have to be careful not to confuse them with representing reality. It's only a model. So we can choose to model things with objects or actors or functions with varying degrees of fit and fidelity in the hopes of managing the messy real world complexity of the problem. But there's a big leap from use x to model y to everything is an x. Everything is an object is wrong for two reasons, at least two reasons, the object part and the everything part. But, you know, functional purism today is no more attractive than the OO purism bet was back in 1989. And so, okay, we have to abstract things away from the real world in order to have any chance of solving them with software because the world is so full of messy accidental detail that we have to find a way of filtering it out. But we have to keep our eye on the goal, which is solving a problem in the world, not a problem in our software. And to do that, we may very well need objects and functions and actors and maybe also peanut butter sandwiches. So, you know, it's really easy to mistake our tools and our paradigms for, for reality, right? So in the real world, we have a problem to solve, like, I want to make a phone call from my car. And we decide, for good or bad reason, that the easiest way to solve it is to turn it into a software problem. So we have to transform our problem into a set of inputs that are going to be seen by a program, and a set of desired outputs that correspond to our goal. And then we write a program to turn the inputs into the outputs, and hopefully we're done. So, there's some process by which we turn a real-world problem into a set of abstract software requirements, and then we can solve our problem in the more practical domain of software. And so we'll call this mapping F, and then there's an inverse mapping, F inverse, that maps back to the, uh, the real-world space. And this is a perfectly useful way to apply what we know to solve problems in a more tractable domain, except that we often make this one big mistake, which is we assume that this f function and its partner, f inverse, is a homomorphism. In other words, that it actually captures all the interesting real-world structure of the problem, maps it to the software space, and properly maps it back. And the danger is information is lost in this mapping. And the more the mismatch is between our everything is an X model and the real problem we're solving, the more likely we are to get something where we have a program that transforms the inputs to the outputs, but, and it ticks all the boxes on the requirement sheet, but it doesn't actually solve the problem in the real world. And you know, as programmers, of course, we're comfortable solving programming problems rather than messy real world problems. We can easily confuse writing the program with solving the problem. So we shouldn't do that. <clears throat> In our more arrogant moments, we might even describe what we do as building abstractions for a living. Sounds pretty good, right? But abstraction is a double-edged sword. Uh, if you look it up in the dictionary, you'll find several definitions. It could mean reduced to an idealized form, you know, separating away all the confounding details to reveal the essence of something. Well, that sounds pretty good. I'd like to be associated with that kind of abstraction. But it also means difficult to understand. And that's the kind of abstraction we think about when we look at other people's code, right? 
But, you know, even the first is kind of suspect. Uh, different details matter at different times and at different degrees when you're trying to solve real problems. So by necessity, the abstractions we use in programming are going to be leaky. And, you know, we use these abstractions or tools to manage complexity and support reuse, but they're not an end unto themselves. They're tools to solve problems. So we have to continually ask ourselves whether our abstractions are serving the user and, sol and solving the problem or whether they're mainly sol serving us. Because remember, the user doesn't care about their abstractions. They just want their car to talk to their phone. So, okay, I like objects and I like functional programming. I know a lot of people who are saying that they're moving on from objects to functional. And, you know, for a while that made me start to wonder, well, if I still like object-oriented programming and all these guys are like, have moved past it, what does that make me, right? So I didn't really like that explanation, so I tried to come up with a better one. Um, now, I probably have a somewhat different experience of programming than the average developer because most of the code that I write these days is platform libraries. And you know, when you're working on platform libraries, you're on the other side of a lot of boundaries from your users. Uh, maintenance boundaries, versioning boundaries, encapsulation boundaries, compilation boundaries, compatibility boundaries, security boundaries. You, know, you can't count on your library uh, being co-evolved or co-compiled with its clients or its subclasses because they're maintained by different groups of people. Um, it, you want to hide your internals, so you have the, uh, the freedom to evolve your implementation separately from your clients, and sometimes because you have cons security constraints to enforce. And you know, in a dynamically linked platform like Java, this happens so automatically that we don't even notice um, you know, that as long as you've evolved your library in a responsible way, you just drop a new jar on the class path and it all works without recompilation. OO languages are great at boundaries. They give us tools for precisely defining, navigating, and defending those boundaries. So it stands to reason that OO is at its best when a code base spans boundaries. And platform libraries are a great example of this. Um, sometimes even artificial boundaries are helpful uh, just so that we, they can help us manage the complexity. So they limit the, uh, you know, the required scope of analysis or deployment to a small uh, region of code. The more my client binds to my data representation, the more I have to uh, audit, more code I have to audit when I want to make a change. So this is obviously a big deal for security, but it's also uh, a big deal for correctness as al al algorithms get more complicated. So as an example, take concurrent hash map in Java or the fork join pool scheduler. So these are both examples of really, really tricky code, you know, subtle representational invariants. So it's really a good thing that the clients not only don't have to, but actually can't try to reason about the representation. They just use the, service, the services of, of the, uh, the API. So you might be thinking, okay, that's great for you. You write platform libraries. I'm an application writer. What does this do for me? Now, the benefit's more indirect, but it's, it's no less real, because as we evolve the Java language, one of the considerations we ask ourselves is, will this change enable expressive new library idioms? Because if you make it really easy to develop and distribute robust libraries, you get a richer ecosystem, and that means application developers have a bigger variety of high-quality libraries to choose from. Um, and this is true not just uh, for applications, but for languages as well. I mean, so think about, um, you know, why did uh, Scala or Clojure choose to target the JVM? Well, where, you know, where would Akka be without the, the fork join pool? There's a huge uh, uh, ecosystem of libraries that they can just leverage. And, and so uh, the richness of the ecosystem benefits everybody. So... On the topic of boundaries, I have kind of a favorite talk uh, that I like to recommend on the subject, which is called Big Surprise Boundaries by uh, Gary Bernhardt. And in it, he talks about how to uh, balance the use of OO and FP in one system. And you know, he points out that like, within a closed domain, the functional idioms really win, um, because we don't have any needs for boundaries. Uh, but as we approach the parts of the system that deal with messy things like uh, other code, I.O., state, failure, communication, uh, the strength of objects starts to dominate. So like this diagram is meant to suggest uh, you know, this separation of you have the functional entities in the middle, which are little circles, and then the outer shell uh, is what's dealing with the nastiness of state and I.O. and failure, and it's your interface to the outside world. And the considerations at the boundary are very different from the considerations on the inside. You know, on the inside, you control the code, it's recompiled together, there's no boundaries, it's maintained by the same people. 
across boundaries, you're thinking about validation, defensive copies, failure management, separate compilation, versioning, security, migration compatibility. And these are wholly different considerations. So sometimes this shell is code that we write, sometimes it's part of your runtime. I mean, this diagram could describe an Erlang actor, right? Within the actor code, everything is pretty and clean and functional, uh, but between actors, there's a lot of messy stateful stuff going on with message queuing and retrying and failure. And it's easy to think of Erlang as purely functional because all the messy stuff is hidden inside, but it's in there and it's imperative and it's messy. So Erlang's actors are really like classical objects. In fact, they're more like Alan Kay's vision of objects than what we find in C++ or Java. And you, know, you can make a similar argument about microservices, right? Within the service, you can use functional idioms really well, but at the boundaries, you're dealing with IO and state and failure, and that's anything but functional. So it's kind of amusing that in our desire to move beyond objects, we kind of keep reinventing them and just giving them new names. So a small program might be represented as one instance of this pattern, but it might make sense to represent it as a networking uh, network of cooperating shells. And so in designing systems, an important architectural question is, where do we put the boundaries? And you could put that another way, which is, what are the objects? Not the low-level implementation classes in Java or C++, but the, the, the classical OO objects, the independent entities that communicate with each other by sending messages. So I, I think we're starting to see what it means to rise above both OO and FP. Use them at different granularities. Use OO modeling to find the right places in your application to put boundaries. Use FP techniques within those boundaries. And you can do both of those in one language. You know, one of the big complaints about OO is we have too many boundaries, we use them when we're not needed, but one of the thing that, things that OO has to teach the functional world is sometimes putting boundaries between you and yourself is one of the best tools we have for containing complexity. So functional programmers like to tell themselves that FP is an evolutionary advance over object-oriented programming, but you know, this is kind of like tribal think, right? You know, and in a funny way, the trend uh, towards FP is also kind of a step backwards in this same progression. And if you think about the conditions under which OO came up, the world was procedural. We had no language support for encapsulation or dynamic dispatch, but you know, we were smart. We were able to simulate them with function pointers and programmer discipline. But the result was inevitable. Clients would end up binding too tightly to their data representation, and ultimately that put a limit on how much our programs could scale. So FP offers us way more uh, than uh, Imperative did in the way of uh, behavioral abstraction. But when it comes to data representation, a lot of FP languages kind of take a step backwards into that procedural world. And the temptation is there for the clients to take the data apart directly. And the same risk of limitation of scale is present. And I don't think it's accidental that the biggest FP programs are much, much smaller than the biggest OO programs. And that's not because functional languages are so much more expressive. A more cultural way in which the trend uh, towards FP is a bit of a step backwards is how it acknowledges and talks about real world complexity. Um, this was an observation made by Brian Marek uh, about the sort of culture of documentation in, uh, in language communities. Writing about FP languages tends to leave aside the messy real world problems from their documentation samples, whereas a lot of writing about OO tries to meet the complexity head on to show how these mechanisms contain real world complexity. And, and I think it's because functional programming is sort of singing us a siren song that makes us want to believe we can make the real world as neat and tidy as mathematics, which, you know, don't get me wrong, I would love it if that was the case, but we can't do that. So we need to rise above our desire for things to be cleaner and simpler than they are and engage the he complexity head on with all the tools we have for the job. So once we let go of this tribal belief that one is better than the other, it's possible to get the best of both worlds. FP is great when you're dealing purely with data. And inside you know, the functional core of, uh, of a lot of programs, it is all just data. And they're all living on the same side of all the boundaries. Similarly, OO focuses on modeling of active entities. And so it's really good in system components that have to mediate between the program and the outside world. And we get to rise above because both of these offers us complementary tools for managing the complexity. 
And complexity is really the name of the game. We are awash in a sea of complexity. Some of it is inherent, some of it is accidental, and the central goal of programming language design should be to give us tools for managing complexity. And the fact that there's so many languages out there illustrates that complexity comes in a lot of shapes and sizes, and no one paradigm is going to be perfect for all of it. The reality is that we're always going to be operating at the limits of our ability to manage the complexity. Because think about like the last time you rebuilt a system. A better technology comes along, it promises that you know, you'll be able to scale better without being overwhelmed by the complexity. So what do we then do? Well, we rebuild our world in the new image, and we hope it's going to take us back to a lower complexity world. But then the next thing we turn around and do is we immediately build a bigger system. And we build until we, again, hit the threshold of what, where we're able to contain the complexity. Once one limiting factor is removed, another one emerges. And the cycle of hype and disappointment spins again on us. And it really can't be any other way, because the economic factors are always pushing us towards building bigger and more powerful systems. So as a community, we've discovered basically one trick in the last 40 years for managing complexity. It goes by multiple names. You could call it divide and conquer. You could call it composition. It's, it's the same either way. And in that big list of things that everything is not, they all claim their secret weapon is composition. Functions compose, objects compose, actors compose. The reason, you know, the reason is none of these paradigms own composition any more than you know, any one language owns garbage collection. This is the fundamental technique we have for managing complexity. So they both guide us, both OO and FP guide us towards um, divide and conquer, but from different directions and at different granularities. OO takes kind of a top-down approach. It encourages us to draw the encapsulation boundaries so that we can replace global analyses with local ones. FP encourages us to build upwards, compose simple building blocks into build bigger building blocks. Obviously, one works better in the large, the, um, but gets in the way when you try it in the small. The other kind of shines with composition in the small, but its minimalism can often constrain its ability to scale. So the false dichotomy of uh, functional versus uh, imperative or versus object is kind of related to another false dichotomy, which is, should programming be more like math or like physics? Now. As a mathematician, I have my own personal opinion. And I, you know, I like this comic because it feeds my sense of confirmation bias. And I suspect a lot of functional programmers might feel the same way. But it's really easy to be seduced by the math and lose sight of the fact that we're always running on a real machine. We ignore that at our own peril. Registers are not immutable. Down in the hardware, everything's mutable. So uh, functional languages give us a nice illusion, but down in the real world, uh, at, at, at the machine level, it can be ugly. Functional languages kind of disavow any notion of resources like memory or threads or files, and this makes resource management entirely the job of the runtime, which can be a good thing. Um, we can focus entirely on our problem and not be distracted by the bookkeeping, but sometimes it doesn't give us the resource efficiency we need to solve those problems in an economically feasible way. Imperative languages come at it from the other direction. They start with the physics and they work up towards the math, and this gives us more control, but also more temptation to get mired in the low-level details. So, you know, immutability is great for modeling business data, but, uh, at, you know, it, it does considerably less well down at the data structure level, right? Most data structures are basically resource management concerns, and functional languages offer us exactly no help with resource management. Almost all classical data structures are based on mutability because it gives us cheaper resource reuse than destroy and create does. And without mutability, we lose like cheap updatable hash maps, and that's our, like, our only trick for reducing O of n problems down to O of 1 problems. And like I said, the, the mutability, immutability is just an illusion. The hardware is always mutable. Um, so you know, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, functional data structures are really cool, but they're sort of the, the dancing bear. You know, it's not impressive that the bear dances well. It's impressive the bear dances at all. So, you know, if we think that programming is basically math, we risk ignoring the real-world resource considerations. If we think it's basically physics, we risk ignoring computational abstraction. But we don't have to choose. You know, we get to play in this whole space in the middle. And we should be happy about that, right? We need both. We should be comfortable in both. And we shouldn't hide off on one side because the light is better there. So, OK, we get it. Narrow viewpoints are bad. How do we get past our tribal perspectives? 
we can start by not letting our tools narrow our thinking. Um, and you know, we can avoid, try to avoid having our models become our reality so that we can shift between the influences of OO and FP as the needs arise. So you know, in this way, I think the pure FP languages are going to have a very rough time competing with broad spectrum languages like Java that offer reasonable, su reasonable support for both paradigms. And you know, that doesn't mean we have to stop doing FP. It just means the language isn't going to force us to do it. We have to make a deliberate choice. And single paradigm languages, you know, those everything is an X languages, they force us to wedge everything into their paradigm. So the reality is most languages are built on top of something else. And sometimes you have a problem that you can't solve in the main language. You have to drop down into the substrate language. Uh, often this happens when implementing core libraries. You, know, you can't write Erlang's message dispatch in Erlang. You can't write the IO monad in Haskell. Um, you can't even write socket input stream in Java. And so language implementers, they're, they're willing to do that. right? You know, like our JVM guys like to say, we code in C++, so you don't have to. But when users have to drop down into the substrate, that's usually not so good. And a narrow spectrum language gives you kind of a bad choice. Either split your program across two totally different programming models with a big nasty barrier in the middle, or do without the things you can't do in the hosted language. In a successful broad spectrum language, you can write more of the platform and the libraries and the applications without crossing that barrier. It's really powerful that we can write concurrent hash map in ordinary Java code. And that means, among other things, that we're going to get libraries like that, and we'll get more of them than if they had to be written in native code. Uh, it also means that users that have specialized needs can just take this code and uh, customize it as they see fit. And abstractions like Akka can just use it. At the same time, um, languages like Java and C Sharp are getting pretty good at learning tricks that had previously been the domain of functional programming. 20 years ago, it might have been garbage collection. Now it's lambdas, coroutines, pattern matching. And, and despite their historical associations, these features have nothing intrinsically to do with functional programming at all. It turns out they can fit very nicely into OO languages as well. Um, in, uh, in his keynote at JuliaCon um, called Lessons Learned from Fortress, Guy Steele uh, pointed out that good ideas survive by hopping from one language to another. The language that you know, develops the idea may not be the one that survives or popularizes it. It may very well be a completely different language. So it doesn't matter what language you're working in. No one can stop you from doing functional programming in your head. So just summing up, we all have so much to learn. The problems that we're trying to solve with software are so messy that we can't afford to ignore anything we can learn from any paradigm, uh, programming paradigm. And we certainly can't lock ourselves into a single paradigm because we like it better. We need to learn from functional programming. We need to learn from object-oriented programming and from others, too. And we need to rise above them all. So don't be a functional programmer. Don't be an object-oriented programmer. Be a better programmer. Thank you.